Good morning. So I think to talk about the future regulatory climate in the next six years, we need to first go back 550 million years ago. When Ohio and most of North America was covered by an ancient sea, this creature is a trilobite. And particularly, it is an isotelus. How many of you know that that is the state official fossil? So perhaps, Representative Landis and Thompson, we should consider changing our state fossil to a conodont. Conodonts were a little bit older than trilobites, and they are some of the best thermal alteration indicators that geologists know that can help predict thermal maturity. So that's part of, you'll get used to that, I make some stuff up. So I made that part up. But really, this slide, courtesy of USGS, conodonts were, some, were probably the first creatures that is believed to have teeth. As they lived and as they died, they floated to the bottom of these ancient seas that we now know as the Utica. Now these creatures are extinct, but not because of overregulation. So now let's go from 550 million years ago to just a mere 102 years ago when these creatures convened at the State House in January of 1912 for the fourth Constitutional Convention of Ohio. They put forth, and all the delegates put forth, 41 amendments to the voters in a special election September 3rd, 1912, and 33 of the 41 amendments passed. One of the 33 amendments was an amendment for the conservation of natural resources. And partic particularly, it focused on forest lands, water conservation, which included the creation of uh, conservation districts, specifically provided for the uh, creation of conservation districts, such as the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District, my recent employer, for the preservation, for the conservation and for the use of water. But in as just as importantly was the delegate from Columbiana County, Percy Tetlow, one of the founding charter members of the United Mine Workers, was a delegate to the, Constitu to the Constitutional Convention and put forth that we needed to have the regulation for the measuring of coal, oil and gas and all other minerals in the state of Ohio to prevent waste and to provide for worker safety. Those were the type of, of progressive movements that was occurring in that era and Ohio was leading the way into providing for the conservation of, of natural resources. So now let's just move to just a mere 50 years ago. 1964, Morrow County, just north of Columbus, Ohio. Town lot development was the rule of the land. The common law rule of the rule of capture was the regulatory program or actually more specifically, the default program, where the first person to get the straw into the reservoir was able to produce the neighbor's mineral rights. So not only was there a violation of personal of pr property rights, but there's also was extensive waste of minerals. Now because our common law comes from an island, Great Britain, property rights was extremely important. And so, the concept of wasting minerals was very important and is the underlying and often forgotten premise of a lot of, of uh, the, the common day regulations that have emanated from common law nuisance uh, provisions. So these things help us to predict what may occur in the future because we can learn from past mistakes and have and be in a process of continuously improving. So, a year after this slide was taken, and this is courtesy of the Ohio Geological Survey, there's probably 11 rigs in that picture, in that small area, believe it or not. And there was no, there was no sharing of, there was no unitization. It was whoever got the straw in the reservoir they produced. Gave way to the first oil and gas law of Ohio, 1965. And that framework from that 1965 law is, is still the framework that we use today that is, is embodied in Ohio Revised Code Chapter 1509 today. So now just four years ago, we can move up a little bit in the timetable, and began a series of changes that the state legislature 
uh, uh, started to uh, put in place, and the rules are continually to be developed by these, by these uh, uh, pieces of legislation. But I was fortunate to be a part of one of the first efforts, the first comprehensive effort of, of updating the 1965 law, and that was Senate Bill 165 in 2010. And I learned through that, that, uh, that effort, actually from some here in the room, um, Rick Simmers, then uh, the lead inspector, now chief, uh, then assistant chief Tom Tugan, and of course the, uh, the late uh, John Husted, the former chief of the uh, Division of Mineral Resource Management, uh, former assistant chief uh, Scott Kell, uh, current uh, class two injection program manager Tom Tomastic, and in the former state geologist uh, Larry Wickstrom. These gentlemen have such a wealth of knowledge and have such a conservation ethic that it was great to be part of a team in taking a two-year effort to be the first comprehensive update of the 1965 oil and gas law in 2010. And since then, the legislature and the administration have put forth even more improvements. And so the uh, additional regulations are, have been in the last four years and can currently still being uh, implemented. But another form of potential regulation that could impact the regulatory environment is leasing, such as what we call, what we can refer to as the Seneca lease. This is Seneca Reservoir near Cambridge, owned by the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District. And under the very stable and capable leadership of longtime oil and gas leasing manager at MWCD, Mark Swiger, the board of directors last year uh, adopted and signed the Seneca lease. And today, there is an 11,680 foot lateral underneath that reservoir on the screen. But that lease had additional protections that went beyond the law. So one of the, current ch one of the recent changes in the law was water well testing before a drill, before a hole is, is drilled, within a 1,500 foot circumference. The lease at Seneca is 2,500 feet pre and post drill. So is it possible that leasing language that moves the bar higher and higher for both additional protections and providing for production and avoiding waste and respecting private property rights, could that be a source of potential regulatory climate by 2020? It could be because it's being proven that it can be done. So future regulations, I believe, can probably divide it into two sections. One would be short term and the other would be long term. So with the recent legislation in the past four or five years, there is at least 12 to 15 rule packages in various stages of development at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Oil and Gas. Rick, uh, Chief Simmers can certainly attest to that in his staff and how hard they are working and putting the rule packages together. So let's, let's talk first short term and then potentially long term. So the short term, in essence, these are going to happen. And this is, not a, this is not an exhaustive list, but of the more pertinent items and the way that the rule packages are, uh, the rules, uh, proposed rules are packaged, could be uh, determinative of exactly how many uh, is com comes forth to uh, the rulemaking body in Ohio called JCAR, but there's well pad construction. So, in, 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 for instance, in the MWCD lease, there's some very specific uh, language about signing off on how the pad is constructed if it were to be on MWCD land. And in, in, in addition to the Seneca lease, there is no development on any M MWCD, Conservancy District property. But if it's within a half mile of the outer boundary at Seneca Reservoir, MWCD does have the ability to review and comment and encourage changes, if it needs be, of a pad that's on private property but adjacent within a half mile of the outer boundary. Another example of leasing and marrying up regulations to have additional protections. But the division, from what I understand, is gonna require a, a, an engineer, uh, a PE, to draw up the well pad construction. Recent changes makes it clear 
that spill prevention control, SPC, is within the authority of the chief of the Division of Oil and Gas. It goes back to risk management. Simultaneous operations, drilling and producing side by side, side, by side at the same time, will probably need additional rules and uh, regulations there. Impoundments, sure to get a lot of attention when this rule package is dropped because it's not only freshwater impoundments, but could provide for wastewater impoundments. I'm told that it is, will be so extraordinarily cautious in how they are constructed with extra precautions engineered into it that they would be very, very costly to construct, but it does allow for a mechanism to have that conversation as to whether that should occur. For instance, MWCD never has allowed open impoundments of wastewater, has always been a closed loop system. So electronic tracking of brine and uh, drilling waste. That is going to be an extremely uh, important to increase the public credibility of how waste is handled. I kind of like to describe it, I guess, as the old hazardous waste manifest uh, law from uh, RECRA or uh, CERCLA, I forget which one actually pro produced the manifest system, the, uh, the paper manifest system on steroids. So kind of will always know what is going on with, um, with uh, the waste. Temporary storage of wastewater uh, for recycling and pretreatment is another area that, uh, of rulemaking that's coming forth. So the Ohio oil and gas program is continuously improving, and that's a good thing. Some may think, well, why do we need to have improvements when we also have production? Because that's a sign of a good regulatory program. A, re a good regulatory program needs to be consistent, predictable, and communicate where the changes and improvements need to be and where the regu regulated community needs to make improvements or pay attention to. So by all accounts, peer review, critical review, industry review, pro opponent review, Ohio's regulatory program is one of the most comprehensive and best programs in the nation. And it is ready for what we have occurring. Now there's always a need for additional inspectors because those points are very important as we learned in the Bainbridge incident back in 2007, which led to the Senate Bill 165 major overhaul, one of the items that led to the major overhaul of the uh, 1965 law. But there was egregious behavior that led to additional regulation. So the long range is, might be better to think about what are some potential sources of additional regula regulations that can occur by 2020. Perhaps something what other states are doing. And say perhaps in some mandatory water recycling requirements could be a possibility if other states uh, are able to efficiently make that happen. Best management uh, practices. Let's say the Center for Sustainable Shell Development out of Pittsburgh gets traction in its certification. It's a good housekeeping type of a certification of producing unconventional shell. Focused primarily right now in Marcellus. Be interesting to see if that makes its way to the Utica. Again, leasing language could impact it. Uh, so the water well testing, as I said, uh, is, in, is expanded within the Seneca lease. Could that become part of it as well? I think the other area, perhaps, is if there are some land use disputes in leasing, uh, leasing disputes, whether in royalty payments and or unitization or um, the spacing requirements, we could have some possible regulatory changes there as well. Hopefully that would balance out all the need for both, again, for, pr for protection, not only of public safety, health, and environment, but for property rights as well and also provide for efficient production. So the third category and the final category of potential sources of a change in regulatory climate could be what I call, it's not always what we do, but how we do it. And that is the intersect of behavior, risk management, and being respectful for the land that you are upon. This is an area where self-policing can have some of the best predictors of what potential regulations come about. And so it is very much so about providing for a better legacy. And one particular area that that could be 
Well, two, two, particu two particular areas would be the midstream pipeline for additional erosion and sediment control measures than what is currently in place. Self-policing there could be very beneficial and making sure that best management practices that are adopted are actually followed. That is a top-down commitment and also uh, I believe one area that uh, potentially uh, could be uh, a source of future regulatory climate change is water withdrawal. And there, where water owners and water users and consumers of water can come together and have a better, more transparent uh, ability to communicate as to what the needs are and what the sources are. A, perhaps a public-private partnership, a P3 model within water supply is one area that is of great potential uh, to actually help preempt state regulatory uh, changes within, the, uh, within this part of Ohio. As you know, the area that drains, that drains the Lake Erie has a new regulatory program under the Great Lakes Compact. Within the Ohio River Basin, uh, we are back under, we're still under the original 1986 water withdrawal law that does not have a tremendous amount of regulatory function because it's never really been a need. And there's never been the demand for the water as there is right now and in, there is going to be in the future. So part of the legacy, leaving, a, leaving the legacy uh, that is one that we all can be proud of through risk management may be one of the best predictors of what the regulatory climate is going to be. The good news is, is that all of us that are participating in this can help make that a positive reality. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.